Hello and welcome to the second GasCast Q&A. The show where we go through some of the questions you've sent in and share our views. I'm your host, Harley Thorne. I'm joined again by Ollie Nino. From plastic snakes to dwindling attendances at the MEM, we've got plenty of topics to discuss. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. We start off by discussing the gaffer, Graham Cufflin. Uh, he's certainly not received much praise from Gas Ed so far at the start of this season. Um, our first question is from Daniel Ball. Uh, Daniel asks, is the style GC has Rovers playing because of the type of players he has available to him, or is it how we want us to play long term? Um, I think that probably like any manager, the style of play is largely dictated by the players that he has available to him at the moment. Um, but I'm I'm also a little bit unsure about what that style is. I mean, I'm guessing uh, Daniel's referring to us being just fairly defensive in general, but I'd say that our style of play already, even though we're quite early into the season, has changed a fair few times. Um, I didn't go to the Blackpool game, but from people that did go, they said that certainly in the first 20, 25 minutes or so, we looked a far... Um, I wouldn't say, I don't know about far better, but more comfortable on the ball. We were passing it around quicker, pressing quite high up the pitch, which is all things that GC said he wanted to implement in the team this season. But then apparently after we conceded, we essentially fell apart and reverted back to last season's style of play. Um, And then we had the really narrow defensive diamond against uh, Wickham, which was obviously what we saw all of the time that GC was in charge last season. But then I'd say yesterday against Tranmere, it was a complete change, really, because he went for the the three five two, which we're going to come on to in a bit. But that had a lot more width in it than anything we've played so far this season. And it, that seemed to be all about winning the ball in the middle of the pitch, getting out to those wing backs to get a lot of crosses into the box to the two strikers, which isn't what was happening in the first few games of the season. So... In terms of the style, I'm not really too sure what that is. I think I think GC still seems to be trying to figure out what the best system and style is um, for the current players that we've got. And maybe if we get any more additions in, that would change. But for the time being, I think I'm not sure he knows his best team or his best formation yet. So. Um, I think that we could still see that change between now and the end of the season quite a few times, potentially. Um, Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's slightly concerning, really, because he's he's shown a bit of naivety. I think it's his first summer as a manager. He's tried to shape the squad into, into, in his own words, a squad that can play expansive, exciting football. Um, We're gung-ho, mind. Yeah. I mean, it just hasn't happened yet, has it? And I think when you look at the squad that he's assembled now, it's certainly not going to be capable of that. Um, Whether that's because he planned to and financial reasons have stopped him from being able to, the jury's out. But he certainly prioritised the defensive signings and no surprise, we're set up defensively. Also, he is a former defensive coach, so maybe it's a lazy thing to say, but you'd expect him to be defensive-minded in the first place and certainly set out those foundations. Um, it's not yeah, a great think... sign that we stopped, we changed our style several times in the first few games. Uh, it certainly doesn't come across that he's got a plan, um, a long-term plan that is. Well, I mean, um, I'm not sure I particularly agree with that bit because obviously DC had a lot of success with us by doing essentially the same thing, you know, the whole projects thing where he'd, change our team depending on what the opposition was doing but uh, the difference here is that I'm not sure that GC is changing us to counter the opposition I think he's changing just because things aren't working so he's having to search for new answers really Um, so yeah I mean I guess I guess you're right in a way because um, it's not directly comparable with what uh, Daryl was doing for us Um, and I think I think the thing about him being a former defender is is probably right as well. It would only be natural for him to view the game uh, from a defensive point of view rather than offensive and for him to uh, view that as the most important um, aspect to get right first and foremost, the defence, which is 
you know, I don't think that's wrong. Any uh, top manager will probably say that a good defence is what um, is what any good team is built on. So that's probably correct. But um, and I and I do think that. Uh, and I do think that GC wanted to get in different, more creative types of players than he has been able to get in. Uh, his frustrations with the transfer window and not being able to acquire those marquee signings that he was talking about have become quite clear uh, in his interviews. And I think what well, I've heard from you know good sources, hashtag ITK, that... Um, that Jack Payne was at the Mem about to sign and then got snatched away from us by Lincoln. And he's the sort of player we're crying out for right now. A really creative uh, attacking midfielder slash number 10 who would just absolutely transform our team and give it a complete new dimension. Um, so the fact he was very close to signing him makes me think that he he does want someone like that. And I'm sure he still does, but... The budget seems very, very tight, and I, I don't think we're probably going to see that sort of player arrive now this summer, which is a shame. But so to to answer Daniel's question a bit, I think it's largely dictated by the players, but also probably GC is just a naturally defensive type of coach. Um, let me move on then, and I'll ask Kath Savary's question, which is also linked to GC. Uh, so she says, what does GC have to do to win the fans over? Is just winning enough now? I mean, in my eyes, unfortunately, it's kind of been doomed from the start. Uh, I don't want to be completely negative, but when you follow a manager like Daryl and the appointment is viewed as somewhat lazy by supporters, you know, um, appointing someone that was already involved uh, when a lot of people wanted a big change. Um, people are kind of looking for problems from the start. And, uh, I mean, we discussed this on the pod last season. You can't really argue with what he achieved last season. His form was very good. Um, all that wasn't great was the was the style of play. Um, I think he began to win fans over, but this poor start hasn't helped. And especially the style of play again. Um, winning is always enough. Football fans are fickle. Um, not insulting anyone I hope but we are uh, if he starts to win games we're not going to care how we're playing but whilst we're struggling to win them all eyes are on those tactics and uh, the the boring football that won us quite a few points under him at the end of last season hasn't started great um, I hope it gets better but uh, in order to win the fans over I think it is just a case of he's got to get some points on the board and uh, now it's, it's it's the same for any manager, you know. I think he hasn't got managerial experience. You could argue that when he came in at the end of last season, there was a bit of the honeymoon period that got him got him into the you know good form. Uh, and now we've he's got his own team. He's had a summer. It's kind of his you know the buck stops with him now. There's no excuses, and uh, we need to pick up some form and fast. What about you? What do you think? Uh, I think what I find interesting with the whole GC and his relationship with the fan base is that despite the job he did last season, which was you know an excellent job in keeping us up, I'm not I'm not convinced it was the miracle that some fans think it was. I think um, I looked into this a while back, and when he came in, there were still we still had something like over seventy points to play for, and we were only about four or five adrift. So when you just look at the basic stats, it wasn't. A miracle, I don't think. But he did a good job, of course. Um, but what I find interesting is that he seems to have absolutely no credit in the bank from that with our fan base. And I include myself in that, actually. Um, and I think when you look back at, obviously, Daryl, he went through a few sticky patches. I'm not talking about the very first one in the conference, but even after that, we went through a few rough patches. And largely, the fan base stuck with him because... He had credit in the bank from the success that he had achieved previously. So everyone was willing to sort of overlook a lot of a lot of things with Daryl because of what he'd already achieved. But GC's achievement last season, which albeit is different from uh, the promotions that Daryl got, but it was still an achievement. But it doesn't seem to have got him any credit with the fans. And I think I think GC is probably really surprised at that. I, I bet if 
if you asked him probably away from cameras uh, or away from microphones, sorry, I think he would probably say that, that he's shocked that the fan base don't like him for what he did last season. And what really hasn't helped recently is um, is his interview after the Wickham game. Where Was it the Wickham game where we had no shots on target and he said that we were too gung-ho and expansive? No, it wasn't the Wickham game, was sorry. The it was game. the Coventry game, yeah. Um, because you either think two things from that. One, either he's just completely delusional and a bit of a moron because no sane human being looks at a game where a team's had no shots on target and calls them too gung-ho. It's just a ridiculous thing to say. Or he's trying to pull the wool over the fans' eyes and make them think that they watched a different game than they did. And either of those two things won't go down well with the fans because either he's being a little bit of a a buckle uh, or he's just not cut out for being a manager because he doesn't see the game in a sensible way. So I think that hasn't helped. And uh, the reaction to those comments on the forum and social media were um, pretty negative and rightly so, I think, because it was, it was just a bizarre comment from him. So I think that has really swayed a lot of the fans towards just disliking him as a person, which rightly or wrongly, um, I think a lot of the fan base has made up their mind about him and the style of play definitely doesn't help. So I think um, I think one of the major things for me that you want in a manager, or certainly I want in a manager, is this charisma. Um, you want that from a leader, you know, someone that, especially at a club like ours that has a lot of problems off the pitch, you want someone that can go into an interview and pick a fan base up. And, and Daryl had that charisma. When we got relegated to the conference, I remember him coming on BBC Radio Bristol and the stuff he was saying... I found myself from utterly depressed by our relegation to quite excited. You know, he he enthused the whole fan base, and you can't underestimate that skill, that charismatic way. It's it's not something you can really train either. And I think, like you say about his way, he's dealt with the media so far. I don't think Graham has really got that power. Um, another example with DC would be when um, Matty Taylor left. And I remember he, he basically went on camera the next day and he did a five, ten minute interview. And the whole fan base went from absolute chaos to pretty rallied up. Um, yeah. And that's something I haven't seen from Graham. And it's a skill that I think two opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, Daryl was special at that. He was really special. And I think that's that's what got us from the conference to League One, really. And when it started to go. And another thing is when you're listening to any manager say things you completely disagree with, it gets very frustrating. And um, that is unfortunately what seems to keep happening with Graham. Um, I'm not calling myself a football expert or anything, but as everyone that listens to this podcast knows, but um, I think he's just, he seems to be wide of the mark with some of the stuff he says, at least in my opinion. I also think that at the moment where at a time at the club where, a lot of the focus, um, certainly upper up, um, higher up, sorry, in the club, seems to be on off the field matters, you know, stadiums, takeovers, etc. Uh, and there's not a lot of hope for real progress on the pitch until those issues are sorted out. Uh, I think the one thing that we're really crying out for is just some entertainment on the pitch because there's not a lot else to get behind at the moment. There's no no prospect of a playoff push really or certainly not promotion up to the championship at this stage so well, if now, there's no entertainment on a good the time to let me just interject with our next question because you're essentially touching upon that one um george clements sent in um thoughts on the poor crowds recently and our very own tom metcalf followed it up by saying we had 6800 odd fans at the tranmere game 500 of those from tranmere um I think what you're listing there is are good reasons for that. A lack of ambition or, or ability to progress at this stage. Yeah, th- there's no there's no hope of finishing in the upper parts of the table, the exciting positions in the table, let's say. And the entertainment on the pitch is non-existent, or certainly it was up until last night. So I think... I think it takes a long time to um, to build a a solid uh, group of attendees, and we've sort of raised our 
uh, even our sort of basic average attendance from, I'd say we had about 5,000 hardcore at one point. I think after the success that Daryl had, I think that raised to about seven, 8,000, where even on a sort of Tuesday, a wet Tuesday night, that would be the sort of figure we'd get. I think we gained two or 3,000 fans through the successes. And I think now we've had probably over 12 months of just poor results and poor football at the Mem specifically, I think now that probably is creeping back down to that five, 6,000 figure as we're seeing with the attendances at the moment. You know, it's only the hardcore fans that are still turning up at the moment. The, the, floater, the floating fans or the ones who aren't as committed, let's say, I'm not saying that in a negative way, but just some people take football obviously more seriously than others. The ones who aren't, really hardcore have stopped going because of the reasons which we've stated and i think that's perfectly understandable you know i live in southampton and under daryl for large for most of his spell i was more than happy to make the drive i would happily drive two hours to get to the mem in bad traffic watch a game drive two and a half hours back that night get back really late and at the moment that is just the least appealing drive you can imagine to watch us play under graham so um and obviously, not all the fans that are staying away are, are sort of long distance ones like me. But I think it's totally understandable that the crowds are down, and to get them back is obvious. We're going to need to either start playing better football or get better results, I guess, which kind of go hand in hand anyway. So, um, yeah, and I think a lot of that is is stuff off the pitch as well. Stuff we touched upon in the last episode, the fruit market, etc. I think we clearly have hit a bit of a ceiling, and and those things need to change in order to get people excited because if if our ceiling at the moment is mid-table League One, it's not exactly... It's almost worth being in League Two for the excitement that you might actually go somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, let me move on then. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question about three five two, which is the formation that we played last night. Uh, and friend of the pod from USA, Nathan Cartmel, has sent a question which says, should we now look to sign players over the rest of this window to maximise the potential of this formation? It's a difficult one because I think basing your decisions in a transfer window on one formation that's worked once is really dangerous. Against a very poor Tranmere side as well. Yeah, I mean, it's not just that though. I remember a few years ago, Daryl lined up with a specific formation with Joe Partington in centre mid in like a CDM and uh, it worked wonders that day and I remember everyone talking about Joey Partington being you know the the answer to our midfield woes shockingly the next game it completely fell apart formations and new tactics work on the first time you try them sometimes because the other team isn't prepared for them they haven't that's not how they've done their homework on you and it can shock them uh I think there's some of that at play with Tranmere and also the fact that they frankly weren't very good. Um, So therefore, base your transfer business on that one formation is dangerous. Um, We have no width. To to just assume that we're going to have to stick this out is... I'm just... I can't get behind it, I'm afraid. I hope it works, but I don't... I don't think we should. I think we need to get some width in and a number 10 and the attacking players anyway. Uh, and that should allow us to play different formations, the diamond better, etc., like things like that. What do you think? I mean, I was I was pleasantly surprised to see him play three at the back last night because I think with the current squad we've got, if we make no more signing, certainly I think it's the formation that suits uh, the majority of our squad. And I also think that when I look at our lineup in a three-five-two, I think. We're not far off being quite a decent side in that particular system because you've got the three centre backs, Kilgore, Davis, and Craig, who I think, you know, I think they're all very good centre backs at this level. So to play all three of them on paper looks like a really solid back three. I have no issues with that. We've got two wing backs on either side. Obviously, both our first choice ones aren't fit at the moment, but even the stand ins, Hare and Leahy last night, both looked. Um, looked good to me um midfield we're obviously still lacking a creative midfielder and i think that was really clear still uh yesterday that the midfield is just a bit stodgy and slow and we need something a bit different in there but i i honestly think that if we signed one i'd love to but if we signed one central midfielder who's 
got a better range of passing and can uh, play a more creative type of pass through to the strikers and out to the wing backs. I think we've got the potential of being a really good side in that 3-5-2. Whereas I think in 4-4-2, I think we're lacking probably one, if not two wingers, and then we'd still need someone more creative in the middle. You know, I think there's more work that needs to be done on the side to make us decent in other formations. Whereas I think in a 3-5-2, we're already quite a decent side, apart from that midfield three, which is a bit samey. So, um, so yeah, I can see us playing that quite a lot this season. But the one thing is, obviously, Tranmere were very poor and there will be, we'll come up against good sides. And if we're playing 3-5-2, they will double up on our wing backs uh, with their own fullbacks pushing forward and a winger on that side. And it will not work as well for us because our wing backs will be pushed back and it will turn into just a solid or a straight back five and we'll have no forward width like like we do when we play the diamonds. So um, so I think it worked specifically well last night. I'm not sure it's going to be able to be replicated against some of the better sides in this division, but um, but I was glad to see him try it at least. Um, so related to that, Max has asked, uh, can we look forward to even better results with the 3-5-2 when THD and Little are fit? Absolutely. I'd, I'd be pretty excited to see that formation with, with those two in there. Um, Tariq is... Will he ever be fit? That's the question mark, isn't it? Um, Mark Little, I think we can be a lot more excited about because he will hopefully be given time to come back in the right way now, but THD's injury record has been appalling since he joined, and it's obviously the reason we were able to bring him in. Um, I'm excited for the prospect of them being fit, but I'm not really counting my chickens that, that he will be. Um, I think Little Little's clearly got pace, and he's he's a quality player. I think he it'd be good to watch him going down that wing. I mean, Hare's been has been a good stand-in, but I think that was what he was brought in to be, was a was a junior that kind of learns from Little over time. And it's a bit harsh, really, that he's been thrown in at the deep end, but he's... he's well, Lit- Lit- he's in- sorry to butt in, but um, Little was also excellent for uh, for City in League One when they played 3-5-2 for pretty much the whole season, and to Cottrell, I think it was. And uh, Little was their right wing back, and he was one of their players of the season. So that is quite a promising sign, I think. Yeah, and I think he suits the 3-5-2. So in answer to Max's question, I think those two players would be key to this. Uh, not that Lee, he's been bad, but THD on his day would just be insane in that role. And it's very frustrating that he's always injured and I hope that we give him time to ease back in and get him back the right way um, not that I think we rushed him before so I think the difference when we have THD if he if, like you said if he ever does get fit the difference will be that THD has got the pace and also the uh, it's just more natural in his game to take players on whereas I think Lee he doesn't seem to have the pace to take anyone on so whilst his delivery is very good from out wide he has to cross from deep a lot because he can he just gets the ball and unless he passes it inside he's got to cross it from deep really because he's not going to take anyone on whereas I remember um, THD playing on the left wing away at Oxford last season and he was playing like a, a proper hug the touchline winger and taking it past taking it past men and getting to the touchline and putting balls in from there, which are really da- is a really dangerous area to get crosses in from. So I think that's uh, a completely different dimension that uh, that he'd give us. Um, so Jack Lovering's asked about a different player with this formation, and he said, where do you think Rodman fits into it, if at all? I mean, the only place he could possibly fit into it would be up front or in that number 10 role. Um, I, what about right wing back? I don't think so. It would be That would be a gamble. And to be honest, the number 10 would be a gamble as well. I mean, he's clearly a winger. That's where he's played his entire career, and he's not exactly uh, young. So it's a shame. I think... At the end of last season, he was really starting to look quite potent and he was offering goals and he was drifting into the box and he was a real threat. Um, he would have been one of the players that I would have built our, our style of play around, to be honest. Um, but alas, that does not seem to be the case. Then again, we're not sure at the moment if he's unfit 
or if he, I'm pretty sure he's got an injury. I was about uh, to say that that's the problem with him. Since he's been at the club, he's barely had a sort of sustained period of time where he's been injury free to actually uh, get a run in the side. So I, I, yeah, I agree with you. Coming into this season, he's the sort of player I looked at and thought, oh, we could build a side around him. But I, I just don't know if you can rely on him fitness wise. I mean, he's one of the, if you want to be tactical with your money at this stage, you'll want to be looking to loan him out. I think he'd have, if he's fit, he'd have suitors. People would be interested in him. He's probably a big wage. And I, yeah, I, I don't think he does fit the formation that we're going to be looking to play. Um, if we're not going to bring in wingers, then there's no point even having the option because we won't have anything on the left. So it's, it's just not going to happen, is it? Um, I think that's the kind of tactics you need to deploy financially to kind of focus on one formation, although it does scare me. Um, but yeah, I don't think he fits into this. Um, I don't. I would try him in a number 10. Personally, I would try him, but I, that's because I'm not being paid to manage the club and I would do stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex Clements has asked... We need another centre back if we're going to play three five two. Agreed, which is a nice way of shoehorning it into a question. But uh, <laughs> what what do you think? I mean, we've I mean, got, yes, I do agree. Yeah, we've yeah. we started Kilgore, Craig, Davies, uh, Manasa is an option. Is there any? Yeah, other? I mean, um, I really liked the three centre backs that we played last night. I think they. Uh, it was interesting to me that Craig was in the middle of it. When he's left-footed, you would think the natural place for him would be on the left of that back three because the other two are right-footed. But he went in the middle and Davies and Kilgore were the wider ones. And I think I think GC did that because those two are more comfortable on the ball than Craig. And Craig sort of sat in the middle with the instruction, I'm guessing, to knock it to one of those out wide so that they can distribute it a bit better than his uh, hoofs up the pitch. So... Um, so I thought it was in, that was interesting, but I like I like all three of them. I think Craig's been a really consistent performer since we signed. Davis has looked superb so far. He's uh, brilliant in the air, and that's something we've lacked for a while. Is a centre back who's just a bit of a beast in the air. And Kilgore, um, if he carries on going the way he is, I know it's early days for him in the first team, but I can see us selling him on for quite a decent fee. To be honest, I think he looks like he's got everything to be a very good centre back at this level and above so um, I'm not sure we need to sign a centre back to go into the first the first 11 but I think we need better backup than Rollin who I'm surprised hasn't gone on loan actually but I think I still think there's a pretty good chance that he will do before the window shuts and so I definitely would like to sign us see us sign another centre back because we can't really play a back three with only three options because one injury and you've suddenly got to change the whole system so yeah, I mean, and even I, if, even if Rollin is an option, that's only one player. To yeah, it's, it's it's worrying, and I can only assume that Scales was supposed to be another option there. Um, but I would have only thought that would happen if Manesa went out on loan. So it's hard having having you need five centre backs to realistically get away with injury free, and you still need to be a bit lucky. Um, mm. Yeah. yeah. So. so Let's move on to the next one. And this is from Charlie underscore BRFC. And he's asked a question about Upson. Uh, and he says, do you think Ed Upson has the ability to be consistently as good as he was last night? He was class. He's obviously a good player, Ed Upson. I think he comes in for a hard time at Rovers because I think a lot of people, have, we've said it before, I think they're confused by what kind of player he is. Um, I think a lot of people thought he was an attacking player, but he never really has been that. He sits back and he plays the simple ball, uh, and he's he's got a good range of passing on him. But the main thing I've been impressed with recently is he he gets stuck in, he takes the ball, and he actually looks to play the pass. He holds the ball patiently, and sometimes it does look like he's going to get caught, but he doesn't tend to. He's quite he's quite good on the ball. He lays off a pass, and I think. If you were in a midfield with a bit more creativity, someone to roll it to that's going to make a run at the defence, he would look a lot better. But because they're all samey players in the middle, it just looks like he's a bit of a sideways Stanley. You know, he, he just kind of knocks it on and, and we don't go far from it. But he was I thought he was brilliant the other day against Tranmere as well. Um, 
and I think he has got the ability to be consistently as good. But I, I just, I really think it depends on how the players around him are doing. Uh, I think we need that number ten next to him. And honestly, if you compare two players like a Gogo and Upson, for me they're very similar. They offer the same defensively, but Upson offers a lot more on the ball. Uh, takes the ball away from players, makes a little bit of space, and then tries to actually move it forward. He even had a um, shot last night. I don't have ever seen yeah, that shot before. And it wasn't too bad, to be fair. It nestled into the top roof of the net, didn't it? But yeah. The side of it, granted. Um, but yeah, I think, like I said, I think he's I think he's been in for a tough time. A lot of people have said really bad things about him and said he's, you know, you drop him straight away. But for me, I'd probably start him ahead of Ollie Clark and probably a go-go as well. Um, what do you think? I'm, I'm interested to know what you think, actually. I mean, first of my main thoughts are that a lot of people have dissed his haircut, but I actually quite like his haircut. I think it's quite nice. Um, my second thought is that... That's the priority here. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely is. Uh, my second thought is that I agree with pretty much everything you said about Upson, actually. I think, um, you know, obviously we keep banging on about the midfield and the need for a creativity. And I think... I think Upson is someone who would benefit so much from having someone in the midfield who could take the ball off him and do something a lot more with it than any of the others are capable of. Because like you said, he wins it, looks up, is quite calm, quite composed, can give it to one of the other two, uh, meaning Clark or Gogo, either side of him. But then they essentially then can only do the same thing because none of them can actually do too much to progress the ball in any type of creative way. Um, so I think the balance doesn't suit Upson at all. I think it makes him look a lot more limited than he actually probably is as a player. And, um, but it was interesting actually last night I was watching the game on iFollow and that was, um, hooked up to the Radio Bristol commentary and Chris Spittles was the main commentator on it last night who usually does Yeovil games and has done them for a long time. And he was doing it when, um, Upson was a really key player for Yeovil in their promotion from... League One to the championship. And he said that at Yeovil during that spell, which was probably the best of Upson's career, um, he said Upson was a much more attacking or certainly much more of a box to box player than he is at Rovers. And um, he said he contributed with quite a few goals, got quite a few assists, and just generally was a much more forward thinking player than he is now. Um, and then it was pointed out that that was, I don't know, five or six years ago now. And he's probably lost quite a bit of pace and mobility because I think Upson is generally quite a slow player. Um, now I'm not sure if he always was, but certainly now he is quite slow. Um, so maybe he's just not really got that in his legs anymore to be that sort of box to box midfield dynamo that he used to be. But, um, I still think that, that he can offer a lot to the team, but Again, surrounded by Clark and Agogo, he just sort of gets lost in this swamp of mediocrity, really, on the ball. And, um, yeah, it just makes him look more limited than he is as a player, I think. So, hopefully, we do get to sign someone who can uh, do a bit with it before the transfer window shuts. And then I think even someone like Agogo, I think, would look uh, a lot better than he is as well. Because, like you said, he's a similar sort of player. He can win it back brilliantly, but then there's no one to give it to, really, who can do anything with it. So it's almost like, well, what's the point in him even winning it in the first place? Because what are we going to do with it now? So um, talking of pointless, let's move on to Nichols. Um, <laughs> so we had two similar questions from Denner28 and Andy Baxter, essentially asking whether Nichols is now bottom of the pecking order, striker-wise, and whether the failed one-on-one -on -one he had against Tranmere is the end of the road for him at Rovers. I mean, he's, he was off the road for a long time, wasn't he? Um, it's time to move on, I'm afraid. I think the only reason he hasn't moved on is because there are no suitors. I suspect he's on a decent wage and we don't want to have to pay him off. Um, I know that Exeter would be interested in taking him back. I've heard that a few times, but it's, it's the salary. I mean, we can't just let him go and pay off a huge percentage of that. Um, his confidence has always been a problem and you kind of respect him a little bit more for that he's not like Stefan Payne whereby he's been lazy here and he's not worked hard enough and you kind of feel like he doesn't want to be here very much the opposite 
if anything, you feel like he tries too hard. But unfortunately, it's just been too long. It was too long for Luke James when we had him for a whole season and he failed to score. We've had Nichols for, what, two and a half seasons now and nothing is changing. He's he's not going to get a better chance than he did against Tranmere. Uh, he needed to have for confidence and you know straight away Graham was yelling over to him to get his chin up and it's, it won't work, will it? It just won't work. He's He's a confidence player that will not score goals for us. So... It's time to move on one way or another, I think. I think um, I think the way he tried to take that one-on-one last night said everything about his confidence and where his head's at because um, he was it was crying out for him to take it around the keeper. I mean, the keeper, by the time Nichols shot, the keeper was, I think he was just outside the area and essentially led on the floor. If Nichols had tried to take it around him, the keeper was literally powerless to do anything about it and he could have just rolled it into the empty net. And then by the time he went to shoot, he shot it straight at the keeper and rolled it along the floor where the keeper was already lying. I mean, the the whole timing of the finish that he attempted was just way off. Um, and it's obviously no surprise, given how long he's gone without a goal, that he's not taking those sort of chances naturally. But... It just it just summed up his whole career at Rovers so far, didn't it? That that chance and um, it would have done absolutely no favors for his um, yeah for his mentality and his general confidence. So um, I think I I was still uh, on board with Nichols probably until we brought in Smith and Adebayo because last season. Other than JCH, I wasn't particularly convinced that the other striker options we had actually offered too much more than him. But this season, I think I really like the look of Tyler Smith, and I'm fairly sure he's already outscored Nichols, hasn't he? In the handful of appearances he's had so far, he's at least leveled it. Yeah, and yeah, some I mean, of those goals for Nichols were against Barnet. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. So, what more can you say, really? I think Smith and JCH seem to be forming a really nice partnership so far, and that's definitely something to. Uh, continue with I would say and Adeboyejo from the glimpses we've seen I think looks like a good player who could offer us a lot he's strong he's quick uh, he holds it up well and um, yeah I think he's got more to his game than Nichols has Um, so I would definitely say that Nichols is bottom of the pecking order and um, this has got to be his last season at the club isn't it really so uh, yeah so let's move on to some transfers. Um, at Sam Cope has asked, given the on paper astute business in the loan market by Oxford recently, how would you feel if we completed our summer business with two to three more loans? I'm always against loan signings, as you know, because I I don't like developing other people's players for them. However, given what we've heard recently about our financial situation, I think it's the only option we've got. And, I mean, loan signings are better than nothing. So, if I'm honest, I would be pretty thrilled if we signed anyone <laughs> and and pretty thrilled if we signed two to three loan players. Um, and I think it would make a massive difference just to kind of flesh out the squad with options. If that's the best that we can hope for, then 100% take it. Uh, do I think it will be as astute as Oxford's? No. Oxford's have been incredibly ambitious, uh, as they usually are, actually. And um, I wouldn't be expecting any kind of movement like that from us. But, yeah, loan signings are clearly the best option for us financially at the moment. I'm surprised it's taken this long, though. Mm. Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I agree. If it's loan signings or nothing, then 100% I would take a few loan signings. Um, obviously, permanence is ideal, but then maybe with our restricted budget, uh, we can get a better calibre of player through loan signings from a Premier League or Championship club than we could signing permanently from League Two or non-league or what have you. So as long as the players were of a good standard and improved us, then then I'd happily take a few more loans. But from Graham's pre-match interview against before the Tranmere game, he's sounding less and less optimistic about that happening. So I think it could be a case of going what we've got with what we've got, to be honest. 
um, yeah. So moving on to the next one, um, at Removable C has asked, do we actually need another player to survive this season, or could we make it to a welcome mid-table mediocrity with the ones we've got? Um, so personally, I I don't think we need another player to survive. Uh, not because of, not because I think that we're up to much, but because of the state of clubs like Barry and Bolton. Berry could go to the wall this Friday, I believe, and if they do, that will remove a relegation spot. So that will just be two other teams plus Bolton that we need to finish above. And um, Tranmere looked an absolutely shocking side last night, so I'd like to think that they'll be in the bottom three. Bolton surely will go down. And so, I mean, essentially, I think we're trying to avoid one relegation spot. And you've got teams like Southend, who I'm fairly sure haven't even won a point yet. Um, and a couple of other clubs who look really, really poor. So I'd like to think that we saw last season that Graham can grind out results, even if it's not exactly what we want to watch. So having someone like that in charge that we know can can get results in a sticky situation, um, I think means that we will survive and that we don't need someone. I think that it would just make us all feel a bit more comfortable and brighten the mood around the place if we did get someone what's your thoughts on that yeah i agree i think i think we will be safe with this squad um famous last words but and you know what i'll be controversial i'll say um all eyes for me this season are off the pitch and mid-table mediocrity would be perfectly acceptable and i'd go as far as saying and maybe this is what they're doing what's the point in investing in mid-table mediocrity. If if they believe we've got enough, what's the point in wasting any more money? And um, also, if they believe that they're going to be handing the club over soon, why are they going to splash any cash at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've trimmed the budget. That's pretty well documented. And I think that kind of is a huge thing to any potential takeover. You know, they want to see that the funds are being treated well. And... Um, I think with the slashed budget, which is certainly a lot lower, I think the rumoured numbers were slashing at least a million off the budget. Um, we might be closer to breaking even. Um, and that's all anyone wants to see. You know, They want to see potential and, and a club that's not leaking money. And even if it's got a lot of debt already, they'll be focused on the last results. And um, at this moment, I think, with the help of Tom Gorringe and other movements, I think we're coming close to that. So pretty boring answer to be honest i think <laughs> mediocrity is uh is kind of the best we can hope for but also i think it is achievable with this squad yeah and i would be happy to to save the pennies but at the same time as we said earlier that's gonna affect your attendances because what's the point in turning up you know if if you haven't got anything to aim for and i think we really need a cup run or something like that to, to keep everyone entertained this season whilst we just go about our business and do the bare minimum in the league. Yeah, I agree. Uh, moving on to uh, a topic that <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this one. I mean, yeah. Um, a certain ex-player of ours returns to the Memorial Stadium on Saturday. Uh, as we face Oxford United, which is always a pretty tasty game. But that's certainly amplified. Um, Ian they usually Finney, beat us at the Mem, don't they? Yeah, and we normally beat them at the Kassam. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's uh, do it the other way around this season. Uh, at Ian Fippin has sent in with the added incentive of Taylor returning on Saturday. Will the Oxford game be the highest attendance of the season? Uh, much like what I've just actually said, I think... When you're, when you're looking at a, a team that's most likely to be in a mediocre position, these are the kind of games that you get up for because there's something extra about them. And I think, yes, it will be a very well-attended game. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think, um, I, th I know a few people have said this, but I think the fact that uh, the snake is in their side could be a bit of a blessing in disguise in terms of, A, the attendance, B, the atmosphere. You know, it's going to add a few notches onto... The atmosphere, which has been pretty flat so far at the Mem, if we're being honest, you know, it's been a really quiet, um, quiet um, atmosphere at our game so far. So this could really help. And 
you've got to hope that that would inspire our players. I mean, it might inspire him as well, which hopefully doesn't happen, but hopefully it'll inspire our players to um, raise their game a bit. And it could be what we need just to get the whole season kick-started because I think ever since we conceded the first goal against Blackpool and it all went downhill from there, I think it's just felt so flat around the club and at games and um, something like this could be exactly what we need to to really get going and get the fans' voices heard again. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. I actually can't wait for this game, to be honest. Um, purely, obviously, to uh, to let Taylor know how displeased I am about his conduct. So it's, it's interesting you say that, because just to give my personal feeling about the game, I'm absolutely dreading it. <laughs> There's no excitement for me whatsoever. Mm. I'm deeply concerned. I've... I'm still not over what happened, to be honest. Uh, and to think that he will score potentially on our home turf, the bragging rights that will somehow give City because it is their champagne moment. Um, and just, I'm, I keep picturing, I can't help it, I keep picturing what his celebration will be. I mean, He'd 100% he's... do the worm in front of the Blackthorn and like he did at Forest Green away in, in a sort of snake motion, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the least that's going to happen. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about how much it's going to upset me. Um, and the thing that ugh, no one's going to like to listen to this, but he is actually a really good signing for Oxford in terms of the, the level of player that is. Um, so it's not like Stefan Payne's return where everyone jokes that he's going to definitely score on his return, but he's also a terrible football player. So you've got, so you've got that one in the back, right? You, but, and you can stop it. But it's, this is going to be a real challenge, a real challenge. And I yeah, don't... I mean, I'm, I, um, I went on the Oxford Forum last night just to see what they, they said about Taylor's performance after the Burton game. And um, most of them pretty much said that he looked really rusty and off his game, which is understandable because he's barely played at City since he went over there. So um, that's no surprise. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that if a chance falls to him in the penalty box, I'm backing him to put it away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I feel like I'm going to annoy a lot of people that are listening with what I've said there. But yeah, I'm just absolutely dreading it. But yeah, I, in answer to the question, I do think the atmosphere is going to be something special. I think the attendance will be boosted by it, which, you know, takes silver linings, I suppose. I know this isn't going to happen, and I'm not saying that I want this to happen, but do you think that it would affect uh, Taylor more if the fans pretty much paid no attention to him or gave him no extra treatment, no abuse, and just treated him as any other Oxford player then it will affect him when he's given an absolute barrack of abuse for the entire 90 minutes. What do you think would uh, get into his head more? So everyone's different as a player, aren't they? I mean, I remember remember many years ago, Jenison and Myrie Williams played against oh, us. I think, I think for Tranmere, funnily enough. And he was basically bullied by, the, by our fans for the first half. Well off his game, couldn't hack it and got subbed at halftime. Um, and he was doing well for them in other games so it affected him very badly with Matty with any striker in fact my concern is that to be a striker you've got to have a bit of an ego um that's what I love I mean Tyler Smith is showing that at the moment you know the whole shushing thing comes across as an annoyance but you need that from a striker right you need that selfish big ego confidence that Nichols doesn't have and I think from Matty's goals for us you can tell that he's got that and I think that means that as the fan base goes against him, I think it will rally him. And I'd, that's my concern here. I mean, if the fans are going against him and he does get something, it's going to be a pretty humiliating moment. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this would happen, but I'm genuinely a little bit concerned that if he scored against us and came and celebrated in front of the Blackthorn end, that um, we could see a similar thing to what happened with Grealish in the, uh, in the Midlands derby last season I think it was where someone ran on the pitch and absolutely clocked Grealish around the back of the head you know I, I could see something like that happening to be honest um, I wouldn't be surprised either no which would probably result in points deductions and all sorts for us so that would be a absolutely horrible situation but um, and you'd like to think that someone like I don't know Kilgore 
in the first five minutes is just going to snap him and uh, <laughs> and take him out of the game. But we all know that realistically in the modern day, if he does that, he's getting sent off. So no one's actually going to be able to do that. You know, in the old days, someone would have just absolutely mullered him. I think, I, think, I think Graham's advice will be to keep it cool and, and to not get fired up by it, to be honest. Because I think... Yeah, it could easily get going. Like you say, the atmosphere might help it, but it also might. Someone like Kilgore, who's, you know, a gas head and could is going to be fired up anyway because of the fact that he's just broken into the first team. You want to kind of keep it keep it steady in this and say, you know, chill out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Don't do anything stupid. Do you know what? I think if I was Carl Robinson, Oxford's manager, I'd be really tempted to uh, put Taylor on the bench for this and not start him because uh, even though he's their big new signing and they're probably all gagging for him to play against us I'm sure the Oxford fans but it is we all know it's going to make the Mem an intimidating place for them to be on Saturday and I think if he's on the bench yeah sure he's still going to get that initial stick at the start when he walks across the bit pitch and goes to the bit bitch and goes <laughs> to the dugout um but it's not going to be the same if he's not out there actually playing. As soon as the play starts, all focus is going to be on the Oxford players who are on the pitch. It's not going to be as much on him on the bench. So I kind of think from a making the Mem a nicer place for the whole team to be, in a way, I think I'd probably be tempted to start him on the bench if I were them. But um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see okay. what happens. I hope we'll he starts. Um, so let me put this one to you then. Yeah, you go for it. Uh, so final final question. Duke Newcomb sounds like he's got a little uh, business going. Who says, who wants to buy a plastic snake from me for £5 each? Meet me outside the Blackthorn from 2pm on Saturday. Is that something that takes your fancy? I mean, the problem is that I've already been on plasticsnakes.com uh, and bought myself... <laughs> are, they under, if, are they undercutting him? Are they selling him for £3 each? More to the point, as I've said, plasticsnakes.com, I've realised that that if that is a website, I wouldn't recommend browsing to that's it. A, it's, that's a it's, niche it's, <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't sound like a great idea, does it? But um, yeah, I mean, I've heard I've heard a few people talking about plastic snakes, and you do wonder if it's going to happen. I'm I'm not sure how. I mean, I've not seen a plastic snake. I don't I don't really know how obvious it's going to be that they're snakes, and I just. I think it's um I think the reason it's been suggested is 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 because it's something that other fans have done before. I'm fairly sure I remember seeing a set of fans throw loads of plastic snakes at a player who's left for a rival in the past. But I do think Duke's going to be disappointed because apparently at the Oxford game last night before it, uh, they had stalls outside selling blue and yellow snakes specifically to bring to the game on Saturday to the men. So Are you I su- think what? you're serious. The Oxford fans. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. Well, that would be pretty humiliating. If so I think if it's going to be a bit embarrassing if we all throw a load of plastic snakes on, but then they're doing the same joke themselves at the other end. Um, we're going to look like tits, basically. So I kind of hope this doesn't happen, really. But um, yeah, well, I was surprised when I read that as well. I do wish you the best in his business venture. Um, Me too. As we always would, especially for someone that's previously been on the pod. Um I think that's got all we've got time for this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. If you've made it this far, don't go anywhere, because I have a favour to ask of you. Uh, we recently launched our Patreon campaign. Uh, this allows Patreon. you to... I it's a difficult one to say. Okay. I think it's Patreon. We'll go with it, yeah. Uh, it's a bit like you... Coughlin and Coughlin, isn't it? Yeah, cool. well, we've said that wrong all episodes, so we'll continue with this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just the price of a pint a month, you can support us. We have a, we have costs like the website and the hosting, um, and we obviously spend a lot of time on the podcast, and we want to continue to do so. Uh, this season, we've upped it to one episode a week, and it seems to be working pretty well. So if you're enjoying it, please head over to gascastpodcast.co.uk, hit on the Patreon link, and you can see how you can support us. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to everyone that already has so far. Uh, you can also, on that website, subscribe. Be sure to subscribe. I don't want to have to spam social media all the time, so we'd be very grateful. Uh, but that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks, Ollie, for joining me. Thank and, you. Uh, and up the gas. Up the gas. <laughs>